Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us to Oktoberfest? I'm Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. And you have found the dark oak. You know what time it is, Stephanie? Campfire story time. So fun. Story. Love it. So campfire stories are definitely one of my favorite parts of Oktoberfest. In each of our campfire story segments, we give you a little five, 10 minute story that you can certainly tell around a campfire. You can also tell it around your dinner table. You can tell it in the car. You can tell it to your kids as a spooky bedtime story. This is all something to get you and all your loved ones in a spooky mood for Halloween-y time. If for whatever reason, Campfire Story just isn't for you, just skip ahead five, ten minutes, and we've got a full Oktoberfest, the Dark Oak episode waiting for you. So, I mean, are you ready, Cynthia? I am so beyond <laughs> ready. <laughs> All right, everybody, get get in your spooky listening ears, and here we go. Our story today is called The Ghost with the Bloody Finger. Sounds very scary. <laughs> I'm excited. In a small town not far from here, there was an old abandoned house. No one ever went near it because everyone said it was haunted. One day, a bunch of local people were sitting in a coffee shop chatting about bravery One man in particular was bragging loudly, I'm not afraid of anything, he boasted. I mean, this is the start of a great ghost story. Oh, yeah? Asked his buddy. I bet that you aren't brave enough to spend a night alone in that old abandoned house. The boaster didn't want to admit he was afraid, so he agreed to sleep in the house that very night. At dusk, he arrived at the house alone. He checked every room and found nothing unusual. He chose an upstairs bedroom, spread out his sleeping bag on the floor, and went to sleep. Seemed pretty brave. But just as he had dozed off, he heard a faint sound coming from downstairs. He kind of strained to hear what it was, but thought, yeah, maybe it's just the wind blowing. But then he definitely heard something moaning in the distance. I am the ghost of the bloody finger. I am in the front hall. Did I just hear that? That couldn't have been right. So he just decided he was imagining things, closed his eyes again. Then he heard again, but a bit louder. I am the ghost of the bloody finger. I am at the bottom of the stairs. He thought, my imagination is really getting the better of me. Maybe I shouldn't have listened to those old ghost stories when I was sitting around with my friends. So he said, I'm just, it's clearly my imagination. I am just going to put this pillow over my head, close my ears, cover my ears, just go back to sleep. But then he definitely heard it. I am the ghost of the bloody finger. I am at the top of the stairs. Okay, now he's scared. He dives into his sleeping bag as far as he can, and just his eyes are peeking out from the top of the sleeping bag. I am the ghost of the bloody finger. I am in the upstairs hall. There is not very much separating from what he now thinks is an actual ghost outside and him. So he zips the sleeping bag up. He hears it again, louder. I am the ghost of the bully finger. I am at the bedroom door. The man is shaking now in terror. He hears the creak of the door. I am the ghost of the bloody finger. 
I am in the bedroom. The ghost moves closer to him. The man can feel cold air coming down over him. Terrified, he presses his ear up to the side of the sleeping bag and he hears. I am the ghost of the bloody finger. Do you have a band aid? <laughs> So, lesson learned, we're all created equal. <laughs> and, you know, always have a first aid kit. Always keep a first aid <laughs> kit. <laughs> and maybe when someone's like, you know, kind of sort of asking for help, maybe go help them. Yeah, maybe go help them. Don't be so selfish, dude. <laughs> right? Terrified. He just needs a little assistance. I love it. Come That's on, funny. man. <laughs> that was a good one. I like it. Well, if you like that, you're definitely going to like what I'm bringing to you next. Today's Oktoberfest topic is werewolves. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> I love it. Now, modern day versions of werewolves are pretty pervasive in today's culture, right? I mean, they're kind of everywhere. Authors and movie makers have gone bananas with the idea of these mystic mystical creatures um normally there's some werewolves like pitted against vampires or other mythological creatures twilight <laughs> anyone classic <laughs> um i also am going to report for all of our listeners that can't see us uh in this lab right now i've got on my team jacob shirt i can confirm she does in fact have a team jacob shirt on with an enormous heart just yeah. in case you're questioning where my allegiance <laughs> lies don't send me hate mail i will not change my mind that's no team jacob for life yes i'm with you on that <laughs> the original concept of werewolves though as i realized when i started researching this episode is much more sinister much more bizarre really yeah and much more tangible than i think most people realize okay in medieval europe being a werewolf or possessing the ability to transform into a wolf was not considered fantasy it was like a real possibility oh okay it could happen to you it could happen to people around you and because of this naturally people were really terrified of werewolves right it's like a real thing um People, usually men, um, would be accused of this type of witchcraft. It was considered a type of witchcraft and obviously involved shape shifting into wolves. Often bizarre behavior that was witnessed, like situations of rape, incest, cannibalism, and multiple killings that we would now classify as serial killers, were then classified as werewolves. Oh, wow. Interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. So they would find the person guilty of these crimes, but they would blame it on the influences of dark magic. Okay. So they would say, you're a cannibal, which, yeah, they're a cannibal, but they would say there's no way a man, like a person, could do that. So you must be a werewolf. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of interesting stories kind of came out of researching some of these. In the 15th and 16th century, accusations were pervasive enough that it became known as the period of the werewolf trials. Okay. Which I had never heard of. I have never heard of either. Yeah. So before the Salem witch trials were even a thing, werewolf trials were forging the trail. Okay. Now that I now that you say that, I have seen some werewolf movies that kind of allude to that. So okay. Yeah. Now lycanthropy which is the belief that one can become a wolf or that individuals can become wolves has existed for a millennium. The earliest surviving example of man-to-wolf transformations is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is an ancient epic poem originating in Mesopotamia around 2100 BC. Wow. So we're going way back. Way back. Way back. Okay. However, the werewolf as we now know it first appeared in ancient Greece and Rome in ethnographic, poetic, and philosophical texts. Okay. The werewolf myth became integrated with the local history of Arcadia, which was a region of Greece. Here, Zeus was worshipped as Lycian Zeus. 
So Lycian is spelled kind of like uh, lycanthropy. They mm-hmm. just pronounced it a little different. So Lycian Zeus meant literally wolf Zeus. Oh, they considered him yeah, a wolf Zeus. And in 380 BC, the philosopher Plato told a story in the Republic about the quote protector turned tyrant end quote of the shrine of Lycian Zeus. In this short passage, the character Socrates remarks, quote, the story goes that he who tastes of the one bit of human entrails minced up with those of other victims is inevitably transformed into a wolf. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Mega, mega. In 8 AD, so, you know, pretty modern, right? <laughs> I We're can almost <laughs> remember where I was. <laughs> in 8 AD, the famous Rowan poet and scholar Ovid describes the transformation from man to wolf. Quote, he tried to speak, but his voice broke into an echoing howl. His ravenous soul inflicted his jaws. His murderous longings were turned on the cattle but he still was possessed by bloodlust. His garments were changed to a shaggy coat and his arms into legs. He was now transformed into a wolf. I love it so much. I do too. I mean, it's terrifying, but it's also really kind of exciting. And kind of like, in a weird way, like romantic. Yeah, it's oh, a weird room to say, but I thought is, of that too. It's very, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm glad I'm not alone because I'm over here like, don't say it to the adults. Yeah, I was like, is that weird? <laughs> I am wearing a Team Jacob shirt. I don't know. Maybe I'm influenced. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> now, werewolves really made their mark on history in the early 15th century in what is now Switzerland. It would stay a hot topic through most of Europe into the 18th century, eventually mingling with the witch trials. So there would be like werewolf trials and witch trials kind of at the same time. Famine, plague, war, and religious struggles gave rise to many of these superstitious beliefs. And many of the fears included women being accused of being witches and men being accused of being werewolves. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. In early Germany alone, there are over 300 werewolf trials. Wow. Yeah. It was really a thing. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly, though, in areas where wolves were almost completely eradicated in Europe, there are no records of werewolf trials. So, like, where actual wolves did not live, there were no werewolf trials. Yeah. There were no werewolf trials. Hmm. Nor are there any in Mediterranean areas of Europe, where, again, like, wolves don't live. European werewolf panics were centered in areas with wild wolves, like heavily forested areas, as well as cultures that had a strong um, livestock Hmm. uh, culture, such as in Germany and France. Fears of real wolves preying on animals and children grew into fears of demonic wolves. So real wolves that actually kill people got combined with these superstitious superstitious beliefs, creating werewolf panic. And I can kind of see that because, like, you take a little bit of the truth. Oh, now be careful. Exactly. Blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Okay, I get it. Now, the most notable and publicized werewolf trial was that of Peter Stump, who was a wealthy German farmer put on trial in 1589. His life alleged crimes, trial, statements from neighbors and witnesses on the crimes and the punishment for his crimes were all recorded in a 16-page pamphlet recorded in German. The following year, it was translated into English. Now, unfortunately, at this point, all the German records have been lost over time. Mm -hmm. Incredibly, two of the original English translated versions still exist today. Wow. One is at the British Museum, and the other one is in Lambeth Library, both in England. That's pretty amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. Now, I viewed a photo of the front of this pamphlet, (laughs) and I have directly, I I have the text directly here for the front of the pamphlet. Okay. It is written in Old English. Okay. And when I say Old English, I mean old. it, It took me a while to even decipher like what some of the letters were, what some of the words were because of the strange text, some of the spelling. 
but this is what it says. A true discourse declaring the damnable life of one Stub Peter, a most wicked sorcerer who in the likeness of a wolf committed many murders continuing his devilish practice 25 years, killing and devouring men, women, and children, who, for the same fact, was taken and executed on the 31st of October, last passed in the town of Bedburg near the city of Colin in Germany, truly translated out of the High Dutch, according to the copy printed in Colin, brought over into England by George Boris, Ordinary post, the 11th day of the present month of June 1590, who did both see and hear the same. At London, printed for Edward Vinge, and are to be sold in the Fleet Street at the sign of the vine. Wow. Isn't this fun? It is. So he was executed. Oh, I'm going to tell you all about him. Okay. He was absolutely executed. Because as you're reading that, I'm thinking, did he really kill all the people? Like, okay, yeah, all right. I'm, I, I, you're already getting excited. <laughs> I'm like, tell me about this guy, Peter. Now, this pamphlet is reported as being the most accurate account of Peter Stump's life and death, but there are also additional publications and eyewitness, re- eyewitness reports confirming the details of the pamphlet. So it's believed by historians that most of the things reported are true. Okay. You know, because of course you say, well, is this fiction? Is this fantasy? Is sure. this like a precautionary tale? No, there are eyewitness reports that back up a lot of this. All right. That's awesome. Now, in the Middle Ages, there were several weaponized methods by which you could turn into a werewolf. First was being bitten or scratched by another werewolf. Okay. Right? That's kind of in line with what we think today. Yes. Right? But... You could also be turned by drinking from a lycanthropus river, a magic river. Okay, I was going to ask, am I dumb if I ask what lycanthropy is? Well, remember, lycanthropy okay, is the right. belief that the you belief can turn a into wolf. a wolf. Okay, so a wolf. So if you drink from a lycanthropus river, like an enchanted river. Clearly. Clearly. Become. Okay. I mean, yes. these are the obvious ways you become a werewolf, right? right? So somebody either knowingly or mistakenly drank from this random lycanthropus river and is now a werewolf. Sure. Also, drinking water from a wolf's paw print on the ground, werewolf. I can see that. Yeah. That makes sense. So be careful. I will double check next time I drink from a print on the ground make sure it's not a werewolf they sure it's not a werewolf right. bigfoot maybe but <laughs> or even a regular wolf don't drink from no paw wolf prints. okay no okay even a regular wolf there could be something in it that's true you don't know you just don't know right witchcraft is also a biggie so either you were involved in witchcraft or you were cursed by somebody else dabbling in witchcraft um lastly you just straight sell your soul to the devil okay you know natch so lots of ways. Pretty much anybody could be a werewolf. Pretty much. There are so many ways you could knowingly or unknowingly um, yeah. just become a werewolf. Uh, yeah. Lots of things to look out for. Lots of thing. Lots of anxiety. Lots of anxiety <laughs> causing things. I'm, I might even be a werewolf right now. I'm not even. Yeah, I'm yeah, feeling it. You may. After you read this, it, it's possible. Oh, so, no. yeah. Um, now, the mechanism by which you transform into a werewolf is also a little different than we understand today. Because today, you know, full moon, werewolf, right? But the Middle Ages, you could transform into a wolf by rubbing a magic balm or ointment on yourself. If somebody just slips you a little ointment, be careful. It could be a werewolf ointment. Okay. Yeah. Dangerous. Um, Also, putting on an enchanted piece of wolf's skin or fur. And this could be more as a cape or um, as a belt. The belt was so common, actually, that it was referred to as a wolf belt. Okay. You never know who was wearing a wolf belt. And you put this on, werewolf. You become a werewolf. And then you take it off, you're not a werewolf anymore. Oh. You turn back into human form. So it doesn't, it's only when you're wearing the garment. Exactly. I see. So, like, you rub on the ointment, you become a werewolf, you take off the ointment, you're not a werewolf anymore. Oh, okay. I see. So that's why people can go, you know, avoid being detected, because you can just turn back into your human form whenever you want to. 
this is convenient. It is. Okay. It is. Especially when you're trying to accuse someone of being a werewolf because you're like, well, where's your wolf belt? Mm. Yeah, mm. exactly. Mm-hmm. They can't turn into a wolf without a wolf belt. And what if they've hidden it? What are you going to do? We're stuck. Yeah, we're stuck. Now, some of this happened with our old friend, Peter Stump. He was apparently a wolf belt wearer. So that's how he became a werewolf. And now how he came to be known as a werewolf isn't completely clear. We're given two different stories. The first is that Stump is arrested after a local farmer enters a fight with a wolf and cuts off his left paw with a sword. When the farmer later encounters Peter Stump, the farmer sees that Stump is also missing his left hand. So put two and two together. Boom. Werewolf. Okay. Is that how he got his name? You know, some people have um, theorized that. Again, Mm -hmm. if this was kind of a made up story, that would make sense, right? right? And I will say Stump is the English translation of his name. His German name is more like Stumpf. Like it's spelled a little different. It's still, it's a weird coincidence. It is a weird coincidence, but... As also the wearer of a German name, I understand how the pronunciation really does. <laughs> it does make a difference. Yes. Um, and actually, even in this um, particular pamphlet, his name is spelled S-T-U-P-P-E. So it's more like stoop. stoop. Okay. So anyway, I'm just using the... Probably coincidence. It's probably coincidence, but I oh, mean, noted. Yeah. It's an it's an interesting point. It is. Yes. So Stump had a stump. Okay. And so they were like, you must be a werewolf. Obvious. I mean, obvs. The second account is that after a series of murders and livestock deaths, local villagers formed patrols, like lookouts, like a neighborhood watch. And one night, Stump was spotted in his wolf form oh. and subsequently chased by villagers. But then Stump removes his magic belt, but unfortunately he did it in front of all these eyewitnesses and, you know, they arrested him. They're like, you're you're a werewolf. So everybody saw the wolf take off his wolf belt and turn into Peter. One of two possibilities. Okay. So either... He's he, missing his left hand. It, which, which, you know, coincidentally, someone across town also cut off the paw of a wolf. And so probably the same, you know, or he just was a wolf and people were chasing him. And then he just took off his wolf belt and then he transformed back into Peter Stump. And they're like, hey, you're a werewolf. Okay. Yeah. I love that. The real strong evidence they're bringing. Yeah, exactly. Now, prior to Stump's arrest, he was a respected farmer in the town. Although the exact place and date of his birth is unknown, it's likely near Bedburg, Germany, around 1530. In 1589, at the time of his arrest, he was a 50-year-old widower. He had a mistress named Catherine, and he made a good living with which he supported his teenage daughter and his son. The stump pamphlet reads, quote, He would go through the streets of Cologne, Bedburg, and Efprath in calmly habit and very civilly, as one well known to all the inhabitants thereabout. And oftentimes, he was saluted of those whose friends and children he had butchered, though nothing suspected for the same. Ooh, that's chilling. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how had... They they thought he was his friend. Here he is just eating people. Terrifying. Yeah. During Stump's, Stump's, quote, trial... It's a trial. It's an air quote trial. He was stretched on a rack. (gasps) Oh, no. And threatened with torture. Oh, because being stretched on a rack wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. Okay. The the heavy hand was coming. Um, So instead of being tortured, he confessed to having practiced black magic since he was 12 years old. He claimed that the devil had given him a magic belt and girdle which enable him to metamorphosize into, quote, the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled like fire, a mouth great and wide with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. Okay. Yeah. So that's a confession. That's a werewolf for you. Yeah. 
Now, removing the belt, he said, made him transform back into his human form. You know, I mean, that's common knowledge, right? After his capture, he told the local magistrate that he had left the girdle in a, quote, certain valley. Uh, the magistrate sent someone to look for it, but shocker, no one could find the belt. Weird. That is strange. Maybe these magic wolf belts just disappear on their own. Who's to say? Who's to say? <laughs> it was then concluded that for 25 years, Stump had allegedly been an insatiable bloodsucker. Literally, that's a direct quote. Insatiable bloodsucker. Who gorged on the flesh of goats, lambs, and sheep, as well as men, women, and children. Being threatened with additional torture, he confessed to killing and eating 14 children, two pregnant women whose fetuses he ripped from their wombs and, quote, ate their hearts panting hot and raw, which he later described as, quote, dainty morsels. Yeah. That's a visual. Yeah. One of the 14 children, was his own son, oh. whose brain he was reported to have devoured. Stumped loved his son dearly, but in the end, his bloodlust prevailed. Allegedly, he went out with his son into the woods, transformed into the likeness of a wolf, and devoured him. Not only was Stump accused of being a serial murderer and cannibal, but also of having an incestuous relationship with his daughter, who was sentenced to die with him. <gasps> oh. Mm. And that he had a coupled with a distant relative, which was also considered to be incestuous, according to the law. In addition to this, he confessed to having had intercourse with a succumbus sent to him by the devil. Are you familiar with a succumbus? Um, vaguely, I know it, but when, but I don't. It's so, yes. like a <laughs> oh, no. sexy lady demon. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, that basically comes and has sex with okay. you. Okay, yes, yes, yes. So Then yes, I was correct. Yeah, kind of weird. Yeah. Peter Stump was sentenced to... <laughs> Get ready. Oktoberfest is delivering today. Mm. Peter Stump was sentenced to, quote, death by breaking. Oh, yuck. If there's ever a sentence I don't want, it's definitely <laughs> that. Death by breaking. And ex his execution is one of the most brutal ever on record. Oh, man. On the 31st of October, 1589, alongside his daughter and mistress, he was tied to a wooden wheel. It literally looks like a... There are many depictions of this, by the way, many drawings of this, and they're all horrendous. Um, but it looks like a huge, like, wagon wheel. Okay. Like a wooden wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. And he's stretched you know, on it. They have like his hands and feet like tied to the outside of the wheels, the outside of the wheel. And he had flesh torn from his body in 10 places with red hot pinchers. And then they continued by pulling the flesh off of his arms and legs. Then his limbs were broken with the blunt side of an axe head to prevent him from returning from the grave. Oh, my gosh. He was then beheaded and his body burned on a pyre. And a pyre is like a, it's like a big stack of wood that you use to burn like corpses uh -huh. and stuff. It's not necessarily for executions, but mm -hmm. you can burn like, yeah. corpses. His daughter and mistress were flayed and strangled uh -uh. and were burned along with Stump's body. As a warning against similar behavior, local authorities erected a pole with the torture wheel and the figure of a wolf on it. So it's the wheel, this figure of a wolf on top of it. Then they placed on top of that Peter Stump's severed head. Okay, so here's what gets me about these things. I'm assuming somebody is going around killing people or maybe there's a wolf running around killing people. Um, I'm assuming people are in fact, I mean, did he actually have a son that died? The son we're not sure of. Okay. I will tell you there are some theories about mm -hmm. what really happened here. Okay. They're vague. Uh -huh. um, I do believe there were people that had been killed. Mm -hmm. Again, they could have been killed by a real wolf. Correct, right. Or 
another killer. Sure. So, you know, and many have tried to understand. So here's his conviction is one thing. The way he was executed, though, is extreme. That's what I was. I was going to say, honestly, like the minds that can think that up, in my opinion, are just as awful as a, a werewolf going around killing people. I mean, like for anybody to want to torture, like, I'm sorry, take the worst person in the world. I don't want to see that happen to them. Right. Yeah. So the first theory is that he actually was a serial killer. Which, okay. And again, they're using the werewolf part because they can't even fathom that somebody could be this evil. I right? see. I can see that. And so they're saying, you must be a demonic creature. Sure. I can see and that. And they're like, we just have to torture him because he's killed this, this many people. Which is sick, but okay. Yeah. Sick, but okay. The second theory, which is interesting, is that Stump was used as a religious pawn. During this time period, Protestantism was beginning to spread through Bedburg, and it was converting a lot of followers away from Catholicism. And Stump was one of these converts. Okay. He was a Protestant. I mean, he wasn't like an outspoken one, but he was definitely a Protestant. So the idea being, I mean, it's a loosely based theory, but that it was almost like a warning that if you are converting, like a warning to other Protestants, if you're considering about converting, you know, from Catholicism to being um, a Protestant, or it was some like a, a slight against Protestants themselves, like they become these wicked creatures. Okay. So it's possible because again, why was he, why was he so savagely treated? And again, it could have been, he really was a terrible, terrible right. evil person, or it could have been, they were trying to, dissuade people away from from leaving the church okay so whatever reason he would go down in history as being named the werewolf of bedberg okay yeah got another story here all right in 1573 giles garnier who became known as the hermit of dole was convicted of lycanthropy and executed in dole in eastern france the source of his life and crimes is in another pamphlet, which was printed in Sens in 1574. The story goes that the remains of half-eaten children started to appear in the district. And the Parliament of Francais Comte issued a decree in 1573, which demanded that werewolves be hunted down by locals and brought to trial. So they were like, killed children, must be a werewolf. Find the werewolf. One night, workers headed home, um, accidentally came across Giles Garnier crouching over a dead child. They initially thought the figure in the shadow was a werewolf, but as the light from their torches illuminated the scene, they identified that it was actually Garnier. Acting quickly, the men caught him and took him to the magistrate. And they said, some ain't right here, right? He's hanging over like a dead kid. Garnier was, of course, tortured to extract a confession. He explained that he had spent much of his life as a hermit in the St. Bono Woods. He married in 1572 and fathered children, but he struggled with the new task of feeding more than one mouth. Desperately foraging one night in the woods, a specter appeared to him and offered him an ointment that could turn him into a wolf, allowing him to hunt more effectively. Garnier then confessed to having stalked and murdered at least four children between the ages of 9 and 12. In October 1572, his first victim was a 10-year-old girl who he dragged into a vineyard outside of Dole. He strangled her, removed her clothes, and ate the flesh from her thighs and arms. When he had finished, he removed some flesh and took it home to his wife, Apolline, to prepare for dinner. It, did he actually do that? I think so. Okay. So he's a sicko. Because I was going to say, is it possible he, when he was found that he was like, maybe if I came across a child laying in the middle of the road, I'd probably crouch over him too to see if I could help. I'm always suspect of any confession that comes because of the threat of torture. Mm -hmm. Let's just be real. Sure. Right. And he absolutely was tortured. I, this guy's really a weirdo though. 
Well, that's, that's a weird feeling. thing to come up with. That's a weird thing to come up with. And there's more. Okay. Weeks and- later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Weeks later, Garnier savagely attacked another girl, biting and clawing her, but was interrupted by passerbys and fled. Oh, unfortunately, the girl succumbed to her injuries a few mm. days later. In November of that year, Garnier killed a 10-year-old boy, again cannibalizing him by eating from his thighs and belly and tearing off a leg to save for later. Oh, wow. So he's just a total yeah, nut job. Yeah. His next crime proved to be his eventual undoing. Thank goodness. Having killed another young boy and he dragged him into the woods, Garnier was surprised by these workers coming home. Mm. After being spotted, of course, Garnier returned to his human form, leading to his identification. Uh, Garnier was quickly burned alive at the stake. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I really do think this guy was had something he was mentally disturbed well if there really were like if he was able to describe like there was this girl and there here's where she was and here's what i did and blah 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 and then there really was a girl found that matched that description that tells you a lot yeah but again this is an example of someone who was probably just a deranged man right but he was considered a werewolf right because because how could they think anyone could do something so horrendous right so awful Think of all the werewolves that the people who would be considered werewolves today. I believe they're walking amongst us. Yes. Genuinely. It makes me look at them differently. That's interesting. I'm like, you are so evil. You must be a demonic supernatural creature. That's, yeah. Right? Well, it it almost helps my brain comprehend it more than just believing that a person can do that to another person. Right. Well, it kind of makes sense, though, because there are some people who are just plain evil. Like, yeah. 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 Makes sense that something made them that way. Yeah. Now, we're going to jump ahead to the early 1800s, which is relatively recent compared to these other stories we've been talking about. And it's one of the most recent cases of lycanthropy, you know, again, relative terms. But this is when Manuel Blanco Romasanta became Spain's first documented serial killer known as the werewolf of Ayaris. Originally, he was thought to be female when he was born, um, and he was named Manuela, and he was raised as a girl until the age of six when doctors reassigned his sex. Um, And at the age of eight, his family legally changed his name. I don't feel like that necessarily plays into the story. I'm just saying he kind of had a a more peculiar upbringing. Um, as an adult, he was very short in stature, somewhere between 5'6 and 5'11 in height. So, like, Cynthia. <laughs> oh, no, that's taller than me. And my husband, who is my height. Love you, honey. He had blonde hair and had what many called soft and tender features. So, okay. a slight man, softer features. He originally worked as a tailor. And he married. Unfortunately, his wife died only a year after they were married in 1833. That's sad. Yeah. Now, Blanco was not in any way involved um, in his wife's death, at least not that we know of. But nevertheless, he decided to make a change and he became a traveling salesman. His work took him across Galicia through Portugal, and often he would act as a guide for travelers crossing the mountains okay in that area Mm -hmm. his first murder seemed to have taken place in 1844 when he killed a constable collecting a debt that blanco owed to a supplier now blanco fled and was convicted in absentia and sentenced Mm. to 10 years in prison Mm -hmm. so it meant he he, He wasn't at the trial he wasn't at the trial Mm -hmm. but he was convicted of of doing so and Blanco obtained a false passport and lived in a small village in Galicia where he worked as a cook and a weaver. While living in the region, Blanco continued to act as a guide for those wishing to cross the mountains. And it was at this time that his serial killing, in parentheses, lycanthropic career began. He would kill women and children who hired him deep in the mountains 
and forge letters from the victims to their families so that their deaths went unnoticed for as long as possible. Wow. Suspicions grew when he began selling the victims clothes and soap rumored to be made from human fat. As soon as you said soap, I knew it. Uh huh. Which earned him the nickname the Tallow Man. Ooh. Whoa. In 1852, a complaint was finally lodged alleging that Blanco deceived women and children into traveling with him so he could kill them, remove their fat, and then sell everything. He was arrested in September of 1852 in Nombella, Toledo. At his trial, Blanco admitted to 13 murders, but gave the defense of lycanthropy. He said that he first turned into a wolf after coming across a pair of creatures in the mountains. He said, quote, the first time I transformed was in the mountains of Cuso. I came across two ferocious looking wolves. I suddenly fell to the ground and began feeling convulsions. I rolled over three times and a few seconds later, I was a wolf. I was out marauding with the other two for five days until I returned to my own body. The one you see before you today, your honor. The two other wolves came with me, who I thought were also wolves. They changed into human form. They were from Valencia. One was called Antonio and the other Don Gennaro. They too were cursed. We attacked and ate a number of people because we were hungry. The prosecutor, Luciano Bastido Hernandez, asked Blanco to demonstrate the transformation for the court, to which he replied that the curse only lasted for 13 years and that he was now cured as the time had expired the previous week. Oh, man, I hate it when that happens. If you had caught me last week, I would certainly still be a werewolf, but it just wore off. It only lasts for 13 years. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's such a pesty timeline. <laughs> Man, oh. not convenient. He was then examined by doctors according to the principles of phrenology. Are you familiar with phrenology? So again, I feel like I keep saying, I recognize the word, but I need you to remind me of what it actually is. Oh my gosh. It's wild in its own way. It's a long discredited identification of skull measurements. Okay. Yeah. Like, see, I need to stop second guessing myself. Yes. You I, knew what it was. I did. <laughs> so essentially it meant you could measure someone's skull and then figure out identifying like characteristic traits about them, like yes. their personality and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they measured his skull and determined that his small head could not be that of a wolf. He was clearly a liar. Okay. So, you know, none of the fact that he couldn't transform or anything meant anything, but the fact that his skull didn't line up, they're like, liar. So this should have saved him then, because he's not, in fact, a werewolf, right? Is he off the hook? Oh, no, he definitely still killed people. Mm. They're just trying to figure out, was it of his own free will? Oh. Or was he... It just was out of his control. He was a wolf. What was he supposed to do? Okay. You know? But we killed them, too. We still execute those wolves. Well, this is the 1800s, oh, so that's maybe true. we were more civilized. Okay. Yes. Yes. You're correct. More civilized. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, he was like, if I did it when I was a wolf, how can I be held responsible? I'm just Valid. working on natural instinct. Okay. You know? Mm-hmm. Prosecutor Hernandez said, quote, his inclination to vice is voluntary and not forced. The subject is not insane, dim-witted, or monomaniacal, nor were these conditions achieved while incarcerated. On the contrary, he instead turns out to be a pervert, an accomplished criminal capable of anything, cool and collected and without goodness but acts with free will, freedom, and knowledge. Boom. Mic drop. <laughs> the court acquitted Blanco of four of the murders he had confessed to after forensic evidence indicated that these victims died of a real wolf attack. Oh, so like an actual wolf attack. Okay. Yeah, it, the whole thing is crazy. However, he was found guilty of the other nine as the remains exhibited signs of butchering. 
Okay. Yeah. So so he probably is a crazy man. He's killing people. And he's just like, you know what? I'm going down. I'm going to take credit for these guys, too. Yeah, exactly. And uh, on the 6th of April, 1853, Blanco was sentenced to death by garrote. Mm. Yeah, garroting's no good, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, garroting is essentially strangulation in this mechanical machine. I didn't know that that was like a... Mm. Yeah. I've heard of like killers just doing that, but I didn't know that that was like a way of executing. Yeah, it's basically you sit in this wooden chair. It almost looks like kind of like a electric chair. Okay. Except you have this thing around your neck that they crank tighter and tighter. Oh, yikes. Yeah, so no good. Um, He also had to pay 1,000 real compensation to each victim, like the victim's families. The court case had lasted seven months, and the transcripts covered more than 2,000 pages, which were bound in five volumes titled Lycanthropia. Wow. Yeah, you know, at least he probably got like a valid, tri- a fair trial. Seven months. At least it wasn't like, I think you're a wolf. Well, who knows? How, who knows how long it takes to measure someone's head, too. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this part, though; it's wild. After sentencing, a French hypnotist living in London named Mister Phillips. That's how people think this is uh, like a pseudonym for somebody, mm. like another kind of doctor. He just mm-hmm. didn't necessarily want to put his actual doctor name on this document, but. A hypnotist named Mr. Phillips wrote to Jose de Castro y Orozco, which was the Spanish Minister of Justice, stating that Blanco was indeed suffering from lycanthropy and was not responsible for his actions. He thinks he's turning into a werewolf. He can't control himself. He claimed that he had successfully treated the condition through hypnosis and asked that the execution be delayed so he could study the case. Mm. The Minister of Justice wrote to Queen Isabella II of Spain, who personally commuted the death sentence to life imprisonment by royal order of 13 May 1854, and Blanco was transferred to a prison in Calanova. Wow. The Calanova prison and its records no longer exist. But it is widely believed that Blanco died within months of arriving. Locals say it was from illness. But there is also a rumor that he died after being shot by a guard who wanted to see him transform. I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Wild, right? Mm -hmm. So it would seem that the wolves of old, while not necessarily predators in the form of of a wolf may have simply been predators in the form of a man. Which truly, I really can see how this legend grew. Yeah. I really can. Yeah. I mean, men literally so vile and evil that the only explanation fitting for this behavior was that they're demonic. Wow. Um, Now, on the lighter side of things, I mean, werewolves are kind of everything you want in a cryptid right uh, yeah I mean, mysterious powerful on the edge of being dangerous slightly sexy uh, but slightly sexy we can't say romantic, that out loud. but we won't <laughs> team jacob <laughs> <laughs> i will say if you are looking for a little bit more werewolf indulgent um on this spooky season I would recommend the new movie, The Wolf of Snow Hollow. Oh, I've not seen it. Yeah, it's a, it's it's fun. I mean, it's a little bit creepy. It's a little bit funny. You're not ever really sure if it's a horror movie or like a comedy. It, it's it's a fun. Okay. It's a fun one. And yeah, just another little thing to get you. The Wolf of you. Snow Hollow. Yeah, The Wolf of Snow Hollow. And um, yeah, all about. The Big Bad Wolf. I love it. I just watched, I can't remember if it's called Werewolf or Wolf with Jack Nicholson. Oh, I bet that's It's like good. a throwback to like the 90s, maybe even the 80s. I'm not sure. But it. I mean, it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember watching uh, Teen Wolf. Oh, yeah. Guys, I don't necessarily recommend you go back and see that one. But man, it defined part of my childhood. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I still have like vivid memories of the first time I saw that. Yeah. Fun. Okay. That was a great episode. I love it. Yeah. Totally bizarre. So bizarre. <laughs> but you know what? 
We do this for our shiver seeking listeners. This is all for you. (laughs) All for you. All right, friends. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Dark Oak. We'll see you again for another Oaktoberfest episode. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. This has been a Just Us Gals production with artwork by Justice Holmes and music by Ryan Creek.